I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you news from across Ukraine, analyse Viktor Orban's visits to Kyiv and Moscow, and we talk about the long-term impacts of the war on Ukraine's animal population. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. Labour stands with President Zelensky, with Ukraine, with democracy. Slava Ukraini. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Friday, the 5th of July. Two years and 137 days since the full scale invasion began. Before we start, you may have noticed a change in our intro. Out goes the clip from former British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, making way for a line for the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Keir Starmer of the Labour Party. We'll bring you our initial reactions to the general election result in today's podcast. Today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, foreign correspondent, James Kilner, and our guests are the CEO of u Foundation, Yuri Tukarski, and IT project manager, Katerina Paranova. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, good afternoon. David and uh, hello folks wherever you are let's start with Chasiv Yar so no major updates there we said the other day that that Ukraine had pulled out of the furthest or northeastern bit of Chasiv Yar in the eastern Donetsk region well today a military commander Ukrainian military commander there has said that Russian troops have burned every house that haven't, hasn't been destroyed by shelling so Ole Shiriev who's commander of the 255th assault battalion which has been fighting in the area for six months said Russia is deploying scorched earth tactics in an attempt to destroy anything that could be used as a military position. He said, I regret that we are gradually losing territory. We cannot hold what is ruined. So it looks like the grind is continuing in Chasivyar. There's a bit more in Ukraine a bit later, but let's go into Russia. And Russia's defence ministry said it shot down 14 drones overnight in the Krasnodar region. That's uh, due east of the Sea of Azov as well as more than three dozen over both the Rostov region, that's just to the north, and then the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia region inside Ukraine. Moscow's Krasnodar regional governor said this morning a six-year-old girl had died in hospital and others were injured after a drone strike in his area damaged an apartment building and a local electricity station. No claim there from Ukraine, no way of verifying that. But staying in Ukraine, and a Ukrainian drone assault targeted a gunpowder factory in western Russia... Kyiv security sources revealed this is the latest strike against the Russian military logistics. So the daylight uh, attack yesterday hit the military facility in the city of Kotovsk. That's in Russia's Tambov region, about 400 kilometres northeast of Kharkiv inside Russia. Unverified footage of that attack. We're carrying it at the moment on our social media channels. But it's unverified footage. It shows a drone buzzing towards the factory. There's a very large explosion. A rather beautifully perfect enoki mushroom appears, which is a very nice sort of mushroom cloud and a long stem. Russia's not commented on the extent of the damage, but something big went up. And it offs- this continues the aerial attacks on military and energy facilities deep inside Russia that we've seen in recent months. So still inside Russia. And Moscow's authorities have detained Colonel Artyom Gorodilov, he's a top military commander. His troops said they've been accused of being responsible for the massacre in Butcher, and he has been held on charges of large-scale fraud. Now, at the start of the war, he led the 234th Guards Air Assault Regiment. It was found by the New York Times, by an investigation by the New York Times, to be responsible, uh, allegedly responsible for the executions and deaths of civilians in the Kiev suburb of Bucha, it's just to the northwest of the main city itself, in March 2022. So as they were shoved out, you'll remember, in fact, our colleague Danielle Sheridan was in the first sort of press packet that went into Bucha, and it was extremely harrowing. I remember her report from the ground. Now, Colonel Gorodilov, who had been promoted for his performance in the war in Ukraine, he's just the latest in a series of high-ranking military commanders, officers and senior defence officials who've been arrested on corruption charges in recent months, part of a, we think, a purge to clear out, or we think, by the FSB, really, to assert control over, over Russia's MOD that had been, the suggestion is the MOD was basically protected as long as Shoigu was there. 
Shoigu was shoved out a few months ago and then the FSB have gone in there in the sort of dose of salt mines to, to clear it all out. So not seen, not heard the last of that, I don't think. Uh, next one, Ukraine's Navy chief says that the Russian Navy has been forced to rebase nearly all of its combat-ready warships out of occupied Crimea to other locations because of the ongoing threat from Kyiv. So Vice Admiral Alexei Nishpapa said Ukrainian missile and naval drone strikes had caused heavy damage to various naval bases, namely, or in particular, Sevastopol, which was the former home of Russia's very depleted Black Sea fleet, is now moved to Novorossiysk in Russia. But he was speaking yesterday, he said they were established over many decades, possibly centuries, and clearly they are now losing this hub in Crimea. He was speaking ahead of Ukraine's Navy Day on Sunday, which I hope they celebrate accordingly. Then looking a bit wider, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, he's in Moscow today. He's scheduled, we think, scheduled to meet Putin. Why else would he go? Various reports saying that, although I don't think they've met yet when we came on air. Uh, the last I saw, they'd not actually met. So Hungary took over the rotating EU presidency on Monday this week. We've spoken about it earlier in the week. Orban arrived in Russia, well, just days after he, he did a surprise trip to Kiev, his first since the full-scale invasion. We think he's trying to set himself up as the peace broker. Yeah, quite how successful that'll be, we're not sure. I mean, he's considered Putin's greatest ally within the EU. So it's a, it's a very loaded political dynamic, we should say. Thought to be accompanied by his foreign minister, Peter Shijato. This is coming from Radio Free Europe, citing a Hungarian government source. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov didn't... Well, he was asked about the visit, neither confirmed nor denied it. But he just said Putin has a busy schedule and more details would be released later today. It would be the first time uh, since the full-scale invasion that uh, Putin and Orban have met inside Russia. Now, the Financial Times here in the UK are reporting that uh, Joseph Burrell, uh, the EU's top diplomat, uh, speaking this morning, uh, said Orban's visit was an exclusively bilateral one as the Hungarian leader, quote, has not received any mandate to visit Moscow and was not representing the EU in any form. Then EU chief Ursula von der Leyen cautioned Mr Orban against what she says was appeasing Putin, warning that it wouldn't stop him. And she said only unity and determination will pave the way to a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in Ukraine. Then EU Council President Charles Michel, he waded in as well on Twitter. He said the EU rotating presidency has no mandate to engage with Russia on behalf of the EU. The European Council is clear. Russia is the aggressor. Ukraine is the victim. No discussions about Ukraine can take place without Ukraine. And so Orban has responded to all the criticism this morning. He said, I do not need a mandate as I do not represent anything. All I do is go to places where there is a war or threat of war that threatens the European Union and Hungary. Right. Well, I mean, he might. Yeah. OK, fine. If, it, if he hadn't said the European Union bit there, you might have got away with it. But anyway. Now, Putin says he hopes to exchange views on the Ukrainian crisis, his words, and his peace proposal with Orban. So they're obviously going to meet probably later today. Sticking with Putin, he said he believes Donald Trump is sincere about ending the war in Ukraine, but doesn't know what his plan would involve. Yeah, 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 you and eight billion of us, mate. So Putin's comments come in the wake of Donald Trump's repeated declarations that he would swiftly settle the war if he wins the White House race in November. Sources close to uh, Mr. Trump claim this week that he was considering striking a bargain with Putin to block uh, Ukraine from joining NATO. At a news conference in Kazakhstan at the end of a regional security conference, the, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, Putin said the fact that Mr. Trump, as a presidential candidate, declares that he is ready and wants to stop the war in Ukraine, we take this completely seriously. I am not, of course, familiar with possible proposals for how he plans to do this. This is the key question, but I have no doubt that he means it sincerely and we support it. Yeah, I'm, I've no doubt that he means it sincerely, but quite what it will look like is another question entirely. But inching forward there, David, maybe two steps forward, one back, or maybe two two in the same direction or, or what have you. But yeah, no, no major breakthroughs. And I need to take a pause there before my brain collapses. Well, thank you very much, Dom Nichols, for that. Francis, you used to work in Parliament. You were Chief of Staff to an MP for several years. You spent the entire night working on the UK's general election. Could you give us your thoughts on what we've seen as Keir Starmer becomes Labour Prime Minister? 
Well, thanks very much, David. Wherever one stands politically, there is something profoundly moving about the smooth transition of power in Britain. There were touching, gracious goodbyes from the Prime Minister and Chancellor, with Sunak welcoming the new Labour PM Keir Starmer by calling him a decent man, something reciprocated by Starmer in the first sentences of his speech about 30 minutes later. Now, there are so many things that we could pick apart about the election result. Indeed, are doing so here at Telegraph Towers, a landslide victory for Labour, as was widely expected. But I'm only going to focus on the implications for Ukraine today. Now, Sunak, interesting mentioned one of the Conservatives' proudest achievements in office was its supporting of Kiev. And of course, the big question now is whether Starmer is going to talk about Ukraine at all in his first hours and days as Prime Minister. He met with the King about 45 minutes ago, who appointed him as Prime Minister, and then he gave his first remarks outside of the famous Black Door of Number 10, where he focused on the national domestic picture, though he did make a passing note of the volatile world that we now inhabit. The strong majority that Starmer has won is good news in the sense that it will be a strong government led from the centre rather than the bottom. What I mean by that is that in minority governments, fringe politicians of parties quite often are able to make strong demands from the party leadership. That will not be the case here, as it was, say, in Congress, with, of course, Mike Johnson being that key broker around the Ukraine deal. As such, on defence, it will be Starmer and his cabinet who will dictate policy. And as discussed in previous episodes, he is strong on his support for Ukraine, having met Zelensky multiple times, including as Don witnessed in D-Day not long ago and as well before that in Kyiv. He has also said that in the long term he has or he wants to see defence spending at 2.5 percent. But he hasn't said when he wants to achieve that by something which no doubt will be an issue because usually defence spending, as we've seen across Europe, is never a priority until it needs to be. Now, I should say there are elements in the Labour Party, which he leads, that are still of the far left. Starmer is more often defined as being on the centre left. And like the further right, there is a sceptical wing within the Labour Party about Western intervention generally and some even sympathetic to Russian narratives, as I say, just like you hear on the fringe right as well. So that voice will not have disappeared completely with the Labour Party's success here. Now, turning to reform, that party led by Nigel Farage, which we talked about before, because they have not been as strong on the support of Ukraine. They've produced an impressive result. I think it's fair to say they've received millions of votes. But because of our first past the post system here, they've only got four seats in Parliament. But it's incredibly difficult to break through in Britain. And so we shouldn't underestimate the groundswell of popular support that reform has managed to achieve with Farage as Prime Minister. God, it has been a long night uh, as leader. But nonetheless, that does not mean that people here in Britain are voting for Farage because of his perspective on Ukraine. Farage is mainly known for his Eurosceptic views and for his strong stance on immigration. And that, of course, was a major issue of this election campaign. Nonetheless, though, I think we can expect in Parliament Farage to make critiques of the Western foreign policy decisions. So expect there to be a vocal voice in Parliament critiquing responses to Ukraine and the idea of Britain sending weapons. But as I say, he will not be in government. He will not have deciding votes. Labour will have a strong government and they have been strong on Ukraine. So I emphasise that. Now, just before I end here, we should reflect on the relationships that have now gone as a result of this vote. I think foremost upon them, it does need to be reflected on David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, who, of course, is still a lord. He has not lost his seat in the House of Commons. He was uh, governing as Foreign Secretary um, from the House of Lords. It's all very complicated, folks. We've been doing this for centuries. But 
in essence, those relationships that David Cameron has built over several months as foreign secretary, strong relationships with Europe, a strong global voice on Ukraine, and of course, giving permissions for Britain, British weapons to continue to be used anywhere in Russian territory, very important. And indeed, the relationships that we understand he formed with Trump and his advisers may well have been critical for giving the green light from the Trump camp to Mike Johnson that then got the $60 billion through Congress. That we understand, and there's been several pieces written about this, was pivotal with Trump saying to Cameron that the way it was put to him had not been put, had not been put to him prior to that. So Cameron is out. He is gone. And we will have to see whether David Lammy, who is the shadow foreign secretary and in theory is lined up to be foreign secretary, though that may not happen. Kirstenmaier has not appointed his cabinet yet has those kind of relationships. We know he's tried to build relationships with the Trump camp, but it remains to be seen. Likewise, of course, with the Biden administration as well. But all eyes at the moment, for obvious reasons, are on relationships being built with Trump because of the speculation about where he might be in a few months' time. So an interesting result, one that many will, of course, be favourable for, given the Ukraine context at the moment, but it should also be emphasised that Labour's priority is going to be domestic concerns here. This is not a government that has been elected with an international priority list. So it will be responsive more than proactive, one could argue, on paper. But let's see who Kistama appoints for Foreign Secretary and Ministry of Defence, because until we know that, and it may well be several days or at least hours until we do, it's too early to say exactly what this Labour administration is going to look like. But fascinating times. And just to conclude, David, a perspective which I thought was quite nice from the outgoing Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who has held on to his seat, however, despite the Conservatives getting a drubbing. He said, and I quote, We are lucky to live where decisions like this are not made by bombs or bullets, but by thousands of citizens placing crosses in boxes. Brave Ukrainians are dying every day to defend their right to do what we have just done. And I think that's a good place for me to end and dash back to Telegraph Towers to carry on reporting on the election. Well, thank you very much. Francis Sternley, for all of that. Thank you for your work last night and for giving us some time just to talk us through your thoughts. Dom, before we go to James, Dom, you were at the former Defence uh, Secretary's seat overnight. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you saw there, just to give our listeners, especially those from outside the UK, just a flavour of what happened last night? Yeah, thanks, David. So I went up to the Wellin Hatfield seat. So this is about 40 miles directly north of London, lovely bit of countryside in in Hertfordshire. Grant Shapps, the former Defence Secretary, has held that seat since 2005. He is a, uh, well, how is he characterised? I mean, he's a political survivor and a very political animal. He's held, as he was very keen to point out in his leaving speech, he's held quite a number of cabinet posts. He's been 11 months as Minister of Defence. He had seven months as Minister for Energy, Security and Net Zero, three months at business. He was Home Secretary for six crazy days in October. He was at Transport for three years and he was also Conservative Party Chairman in all that time too. So he's a great political survivor. He was always wheeled out to be on the sofas to defend the government on whatever it was. So there were questions about how much attention he was actually giving to the brief of Defence Secretary at a time of major war in Europe, Middle East, a lot of other challenges, etc, etc. So I toddled up there last night after the exit poll vote at 10pm yesterday got over there for about midnight and then it was classic military hurry up and wait type thing nothing happened for hours and then at about three o'clock the returning officer who was the high sheriff of Hertfordshire she called everyone together and what happens is that there were five candidates they are taken to one side a few minutes before we all get to hear the vote so they are told the result so it doesn't come as a massive surprise to them but we weren't able to actually go and walk the floor and see the vote being counted but that bit of it is open to party officials they can actually walk around to make sure that it's all completely transparent and so I was speaking to a a few of those dudes and um and they told me about half an hour before the final vote that the vote it had gone to the Labour chap and that Grant Shapps had lost his seat so when the announcement came out 
And the high sheriff read out all the numbers, fo- focusing firmly on, on Grant Chaps. He was very gracious in defeat, as you would hope, and he, he made a nice speech, um, wishing the best to his successor. He then stuck in a few kidney punches to the Conservative Party and how they've behaved for the last 14 years. But it was all very smooth, and we don't take it for granted. As the former Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says, you know, the smooth transition of power is a beautiful thing to watch. It's also a very boring thing to watch because it is so smooth, and that's as, as it should be. So it was very, it was almost underwhelming, as I say, except that it's then, whatever time it was, half past four in the morning, and, and that's obviously when my work starts. I got the news desk immediately onto me saying, right, we need some news, and we need some colour from what's it, what it's like in the room. It was actually in a theme park. I was in a kind of an adventure park. It was Roller City in Welling Garden City, a town in, in Hertfordshire. There was a big glitter ball in the roof reflecting everything. It was all particularly bizarre to see this changing of the guard and a, and a Tory big beast in the shape of the former Defence Secretary losing his seat underneath a, a lovely sort of glitter ball. It was really really quite odd. Um, so that was that. We, we were all kicked out. I had to go and sit in uh, the car park and, uh, and file my story and then uh, get back into the office down here to go and speak to you good people. Um, and so uh, that was what was happened for me over the last few hours, David. All rather rushed, but a beautiful demonstration of just how deliciously boring democracy should be. Well, thank you very much, Dom, for all of that. But James Kilner, great to have you back on the podcast. What have you been looking at and why do you think it's important for our listeners? Yeah, so uh, incredibly busy week. It seems to be absolutely standard. Incredibly frenetic week of Russian diplomacy and diplomatic Russian efforts around the war in Ukraine. The big story today, as Don was right, Orban, Viktor Orban's visit to Moscow, supposedly on a peace mission, he's doing, he's doing this unilaterally. It's not, he hasn't had permission from the other EU partners to carry out this uh, so called peace mission. He has been meeting Putin. I've been watching, listening to videos on Telegram, the, the, the Russian language. Social media at Putin and Orban greeted each other with warm handshakes inside the Kremlin, smiles, etc. Then sat down and posed for photos with their entourage on either side of them. Putin, in comments before going behind closed door for talks, which is currently going on now, actually referenced that Orban had been in Ukraine three days earlier on Tuesday to meet with Zelensky. And Putin also made a very clear reference to discussing with Orban his version of what a peace assessment would look like. So I think this is a very, very important moment in the process of the war. The whole trip has been derided by various other EU officials, stepping out of line, etc. This is the first visit by an EU leader to Moscow since April 2022, when the Austrian leader jetted in for a talk to Putin. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what comes out after this meeting in Moscow which is going on right now. So just a quick update on that one, David. The backdrop, as you were rightly saying, for this whole momentous visit by Orban is this, what appears to be shifts in certainly Zelensky's position and possibly even Putin's position. As you said, Putin has been in Kazakhstan this week. He's been at a meeting of the Shanghai Corporation Organization, which is a quasi-economic, military-ish alliance set up by China and Russia in 2001, become a wider anti-West or sort of Western sceptic group, which is focused on Central Asia, but also includes, now includes Iran, India and Pakistan and Belarus. It's really a talking shop. It's a chance for leaders like Putin to posture to meet other leaders as like a speed diplomatic session. On Wednesday, the day before the main summit for the SCA, as it's called, Putin met six leaders, including Xi, President Xi of China, and including President Erdogan of Turkey, who was there as a guest. So uh, a good chance for Putin to sort of posture and, and, and look like the statesman. There, there wasn't much talk actually about the war in Ukraine, or not many public comments from any of the leaders about the war in Ukraine. Um, it was more bilateral talks, but Erdogan did actually offer Putin to be uh, to be an, uh, an intermediary between him and Zelensky, but, but this was knocked down by Russian officials later. But the point is, the chat around having an intermediary between Putin and Zelensky has increased in the last few weeks. Zelensky has constantly said he's not interested in a ceasefire with Putin. He sees it as a trap. Any ceasefire here that, that Putin offers 
is where concern will just be used by the Kremlin to give it, the, their forces a break, rearm, and then attack again. So he's not interested in a ceasefire, but it has increasingly made reference to some sort of intermediary between him and Putin. He gave a really insightful interview to Bloomberg yesterday, I think it was, in, in, in which he again referenced a possible intermediary between, with Putin. He didn't talk about Orban, who was in Kiev on Tuesday, but he did mention China and the USA. So even talking about it is important. And he also importantly spoke about a potential Russian delegation turning up at a second peace summit. If you remember that Ukraine organized a first peace summit in Switzerland last month, which was, I, I think it's fair to say, a bit underwhelming. The normal sort of pro-West, pro-Ukraine uh, leaders and, and countries turned up, but none, none of the skeptics because there was a massive Kremlin campaign backed by China, its key ally, to pressure and control and charm smaller countries in Asia, and Middle East and Africa to boycott it, which, which, which they did really. There, there has been talk about a second peace process. Zelensky and, and the Ukraine didn't invite Russia to the first one. But in, in this Bloomberg interview yesterday, Zelensky said that Russia should come to a second peace um, summit. This is, I think, the first time I've heard Zelensky say this. So I think the positions are changing. They are softening slightly. We have talk of Russia turning up at a, at a potential second peace summit, possibly even Putin, but, but, but that, that is very unlikely. And we have real talk about using an intermediary between Zelensky and Putin, just as Orban turns up in Moscow. So really interesting times, David. James, thank you so much for all of that. In, in your view then, do you think with these visits to Moscow, the, the Zelensky saying Russia should come to the next peace meeting with Erdogan offering himself as a, an intermediary, do you think we might be looking at potentially the vague outlines of what early talks could look like? Is that what we're seeing here, the diplomatic overtures to something else? I think it's going to take an awful lot to even start real negotiations. But, but I also think both sides are utterly exhausted. That, 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 there is no doubt about that. We, we keep writing stories about how Ukraine is running out of manpower, it doesn't have enough missiles, this sort of thing. Zelensky was complaining yesterday, again, how I think it's 14 army brigades. He can't equip them properly because he doesn't have the right kit from the West. F-16 still haven't arrived, et cetera, et cetera. And we also know from the Russian side that although they put on a huge front, a huge face on it, they're also completely exhausted and their economy is also being sunk by this whole war project. They are also scrambling around for manpower. We know they've been losing, I think in May, they lost something like 1,300 men, soldiers a day on the front lines. That's pushing 40,000 a month, which is half the size of the British Army. So it's a really unsustainable attrition rate. There's a story floating around this week that they're now recruiting female prisoners from their massive prison system to, to go to the war. They're also offering people who get arrested by police in Russia now have the option of signing a contract there and then to go and fight in the war in return for any charges being dropped. The, the, these are desperate measures by, by a regime which is running out of cannon fodder. So, so Putin himself understands that this war it can't continue forever. There was a poll out today or yesterday by Levada Center in, in a Russian polling station, which is, which is relatively, it has some independence actually, uh, which said that 58% of, of the Russian Bayars were in favor of a negotiated peace for Putin's war in Ukraine. This is the highest since, since the war started. I'm not saying that the Kremlin elite hold this view. Uh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm certain that Putin doesn't hold this view. But there is a groundswell of momentum, even inside Russia, to finding some sort of solution to this war. And I think what we've seen this week, Orban is going to fall out with all his EU partners and NATO partners over this. And I'm not sure that he's the intermediary that, that's needed. But even talk of intermediaries, and uh, Zelensky's apparent softening of his position in, in this Bloomberg interview yesterday, these are vital small steps to start to find a way out of this terrible war situation. Thank you so much, Dom, Francis and James.
For over two years, Ukraine has grappled with the far-reaching impact of Russia's full-scale war. The war truly touches everything, all aspects of life. And for years now, we've been catching up with contacts inside the country to understand the plight of Ukraine's animal population. I spoke to friend of the podcast, CEO of the UHARTS Foundation, Yuri Tukarsky, and Katerina Paranova, an IT project manager at the NGO Better Regulation Delivery Office. Here's our conversation. Well, Yuri and Katerina, thank you so much for your time. Would you start just by introducing yourselves again to our listeners? Yuri, why don't you go first? Sure. Hello, David, and it's great to be here on this podcast again. My name is Yuri Takarski, and I run the UHARTS Foundation, which is implementing animal charity projects focusing on rescuing and helping pets and animals suffering from the war in Ukraine. Hello, um, my name is Katerina Paranova. I'm a member of BRDO team. It's the Better Regulation Delivery Office, an NGO that is implementing the development of the State Unified Register of Pets, and I'm particularly the project manager of the project. Well, Yuri, can I start with you? Let's talk about the number, the, the sheer number of homeless animals in Ukraine at the moment. What are the la- what's the latest estimate? What are the numbers and what's being done to solve this? Sure, David. Um, Of course, there's no easy answer for uh, this question as data and statistics were not collected for a while. But our initiative, the Safe Pets of Ukraine project, has been surveying the shelters uh, across Ukraine. And we have the numbers uh, from that survey that suggest that the amount of animals in care of the shelters near the front lines has grown by 100 percent. So it doubled. And then in the areas that are adjacent to the front lines, this number is 60% of growth. But even in the most far away districts from the front line in the west of the country, still 30% growth. So if we're looking at a couple of dozens of animals, I think it's a ballpark figure that demonstrates the scope of the problem. Katerina, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I would definitely agree that calculating the number of animals right now in the midst of the full-scale war is a very, very tough thing to do. So all the numbers might be added a little bit because we don't know the exact situation. And what is obvious is that the number of stray animals, the number of abandoned animals and the animals who lost their owners because they simply died, I'm sorry to say that, is enormous. So even like we, we cannot say that this is something we could count to this point, probably. And when we're talking about abandoned and stray animals, are we primarily talking about dogs and cats or are there any others we should be aware of? Yes, we are mostly working with dogs and cats. Usually we are trying also to run projects that are covering wild animals, but our main focus is cats and dogs. And Katerina, I know you've been working on this. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about what you've been doing and the challenges you faced? Yes, of course. Thank you. I would support Yuri in the point that we were mainly focused on dogs and cats. The register itself as a system also includes ferrets, but uh, we have to understand that the number of pet ferrets in Ukraine is way less than the number of cats and dogs. And of course, this is our main target that we're facing with the register. The challenges we've faced, and actually the trigger for after implementation of the system, is the uncontrolled migration of pets within the country the increased numbers of lost animals because of the military actions and um, all the connected issues. Therefore, we need to react quite fast, but at the same time, to keep in mind the way of veterinary that is being processed in Ukraine. I mean, the way vets work, the way that they have to t- take care of their jobs. And so all these things have to fit as a puzzle together. What, when you say uncontrolled migration of lost pets, what do you mean exactly by that? Well, um, I'll be very open about this. Uh, When you're close to the front line and there are explosions all the time, uh, the pets just run away or during the evacuations, they can get lost. Sometimes, as I already mentioned, the owner can be injured or even dead and the animal just runs away. So this is the first thing we're facing. And secondly, people are evacuating from some places where they lived quite fast. And sometimes this is not planned way in advance. This is why lots of people just grab their pets, thank God they do not drop them there, and they try to move away as fast as they can. Sometimes associations and organizations like Yuri's are helping them to evacuate. So sometimes the owner and the pet go separately to the safe place. 
And Yuri, there are you know, huge numbers of health issues that you have to look at. I know that you wanted to talk a little bit about rabies in, in, in Ukraine. Can you tell us what the latest news is there? What are you seeing? Sure. So the growing number of uh, animals that are that have lost their families, animals who are living on the streets, combined with the security challenges in areas close to the front lines, all these factors have led to uh, an increase in the uh, animal diseases, including uh, rabies in Ukraine. So if you look at the data, the statistics, the number of uh, cases of rabies in Ukraine year to year, it increased 100%. It's still, in terms of the numbers, it's not a huge number. It's close to 1,200 cases per year, but still it's a cause for alarm for an organization like ours to do more and step in and try to support the local communities in the areas closer to the front lines in combating this issue. Because in Ukraine, the vaccinations against rabies were uh, usually done at the level of the local governments. And sometimes near the front lines, there is simply not enough capacity to do that. And also security reasons prevent veterinarians from actually going in there and doing these vaccinations. So we are trying to tackle this issue while it's still in the controllable level. And we have launched a large project thanks to the support of our partners thanks to which we were able to vaccinate, implant microchips, and actually input in the the state registry of 7,000 animals. This was a large-scale project for us, and we are very glad that it's the first step that we are hoping to scale up in Ukraine. Katerina, you must be really proud of that. Can you tell us maybe your your side of involvement in this? What, What have you been working on specifically? Well, first of all, we are very happy and proud of such a partnership with our colleagues, with Yuri and his organization, because this involves lots of social activities and social activities are never easy to implement, especially in times of full-scale war. What we're doing as an organization and our team particularly, we're developing the the software for the system that makes it possible to actually create the register and to use it for the vets and the owners. Uh, I would also like to emphasize that Yuri is absolutely correct in the point that the migration of animals and the whole thing that's going on because of war consequences is highly influential on the level of disease spreading, of course. And due to register, we have the online database of animals that are registered, identified with a microchip and also vaccinated. This is super important because when people are fleeing the war, they can lose the paper documents, they can get them destroyed. And at least we have the track of vaccinated animals all over Ukraine available to every vet that's cooperates with the register. I mean, it's an astonishing project, highly bureaucratic, complex, involving different teams, all at a time of full-scale war. Yuri, we, we've spoken quite a few times over the last few years, and it's been really interesting to track how you've been talking about these issues, what kind of issues you and your team are finding. Looking back, where, where are you now? Do you think the situation is getting worse or better? What's the situation as well for funding? For How are you finding that? Do you have what you need to, to do what you want to do? Well, David, the situation is evolving, I would say. Uh, Some aspects are getting better, some aspects are getting not so well. So in the beginning of the full-scale invasion, we were focusing mostly on the rescue effort, supporting uh, people who were evacuating, trying to relocate animals, place them into shelters and find them the new home. Now we are more focusing on long-term consequences of the war. So we are trying to do more on adoption. So we are trying because we believe firmly that the place for an animal is not in the shelter. It's in the family uh, of the pet parents. So we are trying to do more on adoption and we are trying to do much more on prevention of diseases. Uh, So a project such as uh, the rabies vaccination. In terms of the funding, we've been seeing institutional support coming in. So the project on vaccinations against the rabies was supported, for example, by the International Fund of Animal Welfare. But it's a large scale project and it can only be implemented with the help of institutional donors. We hope to see more of that that will help us scale it up. But also in terms of the private donations, and I always like to give an example of even the audience of this podcast, which has in the past donated and we were able to collect slightly over 15,000 euros thanks to the listeners of this podcast. 
And this is the amount, for instance, if we scale it up to the project of the vaccination, for instance, would allow us to vaccinate, implement the microchip and input into the registry of about 3000 animals. So these are the numbers that your listeners have contributed to in the past. We are very grateful for that. And we, of course, we hope that the donations keep coming because it's the source of the funding that allows us to keep functioning and keep helping the pets in the country. Katerina and Yuri, just to finish, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think our listeners should understand? Katerina, would you like to go first? Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you to everyone who's involved in this process and everyone who donated because this is super important. I would like to also point out that the project does not use any governmental money. It's full on donations and like uh, donor support. This is again important for us during the war. Lots of things had to come together for the project to be started. But what I would like to finish with probably is that in Ukraine, every life counts. So Yuri said it's about 7,000 animals that have been registered during the test flight of the register, but every animal counts, every additional registration, vaccination, or identified animal counts. Therefore, thank you very much for the donations. We hope this project is a very long-term issue. Lots of governmental bodies are supporting us, and again, the organizations that care about that. So we hope this is just a start for a long-term great process of uh, further integration with the European organizations like Europetnet and other registers to make Ukraine a full uh, participant of this European point of view at the PATS. And Yuri, to finish your final thoughts, please. Thank you. I always like to repeat, and this is echoes uh, what Catherine just said, we are running a marathon rather than a sprint. So we need to make sure that our work is well spaced out. It's long term because we will be facing the consequences of this war for many years in the future, even after it is over. And given that animals, they don't know national borders, of course, this is an issue that's the primary responsibility of Ukraine to take care about its animal population, but it's also an issue for a wider European community. And we are very grateful to see the solidarity, the amount of support that is coming from countries like the UK, where we work a lot with the domestic pet industry and see how much uh, generous help they are already, they have contributed and they are still committed to contribute to our cause and many other countries who are doing the right thing by investing right now so that we don't have to deal with the problems related to animal population control or disease control in the future. Yuri and Katerina, thank you so much. Coming up, we hear Dom and James's final thoughts. Let's go then to our final thoughts. Dom Nichols, would you like to go first? Yeah, thanks, David. I'm going to try and wrap these themes together that we've been talking about today just very neatly. It's probably going to be very clunky, but I'll have a go. Democracy, as I was saying earlier on, should be fairly dull when you look at it if it's working properly. And to me, the basic deal with democracy is that once you lose, you leave the stage swiftly and you go graciously, right? That's it. That's the deal. And we've seen some egregious examples where that does not happen in recent years. And the chaos that partly flows from that and uh, partly froze, flows from the, the mentality, if that's how you approach it. So I'm hoping that with this massive majority that Labour Party have got today here in the UK, it offers some form of stability and the way in which the Tory party have moved off the stage swiftly and with good grace I would suggest and Grant Shapps last night I was poking fun at him I wrote a column that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek a little bit you know stiletto in the ribs but he left the stage graciously he spoke well of the person Andrew Lewin who took over from him for his seat so I'm hoping that this ushers in a period of stability when you look at what's happening what's potentially coming down the lines in the US France elsewhere we need some stability right now. There is an opportunity, I think, here for the UK if it is a, a very strong government. They've made no bones about their policy on Ukraine is going to be no, no different from that of the Tory party. And as we start talking about these negotiations, I think it's human nature from what I've seen that in, people are very open to negotiations because your first thought is, yeah, great, I'll negotiate because I'll, I'm going to get what I want. 
I was like, no, 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 that, that very rarely happens in negotiation. So that's when the, the real hard work starts with negotiations. And I'm just, I'm hoping that having a strong partner such as the UK has the potential to be now that if we are entering some phase of very, very difficult negotiations, having firm views across the EU, for example, as Sir Don von der Leyen, Kai Callas, uh, Michel, Charles Michel, Joseph Burrell, then there's a possibility here of having a firm base from which you can work from and negotiate back accepting where you need to give a little bit of ground. So I'm just hoping that we are about to enter a period of some relative stability. I do note, though, as I've said many times before, as a former commanding officer once said to me, if the word hope enters your plan anywhere, then you haven't planned enough. So it's a very rocky road ahead, but there's great potential, I think. Thank you very much, Dom. And a huge thank you just before we go to James and to our colleague Francis, who took mine and Dom's ribbing of him adding pictures of Keir Starmer into his notes for this podcast early on today with very good grace and humour. He wasn't annoyed at all, was he? James, would you like the very final words? It's, it's all eyes on um, on the Kremlin at the moment, David, with, with, with Orban's visit. It's going to be incredibly interesting to see what comes out of it. I'm just reading on Telegram again that the Ukrainian foreign ministry has already distanced itself from this visit, it says it's outraged that Orban has turned up in Moscow because it wasn't agreed in Kiev. This comes after speculation from various Kremlin propagandists that, that, that I follow, who said that maybe Zelensky had a secret message for Putin. That has already been disowned. We're going to get lots of speculation and analysis on this whole visit, and uh, it's going to be fallout from it is, is already starting it's going to be very fascinating to follow david so I'm, I'm going to get back to that thank you thank you so much dom james and francis for your time today just a reminder you can hear our first bonus episode on apple two weeks before we release it to everyone you just have to connect your telegraph subscription to your apple podcast account and listen there have a great weekend thank you for listening ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the telegraph To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Rachel Porter. And the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.